Hey guys, James here from ebassguitar.com and having taught now tens of thousands of students online, I want to expose the top five beginner bass myths I've seen time and time again. So over the last 20 years or so of teaching bass, I've literally come across a handful of myths that I see time and time again. So today I want to give you my take on them. But first off, I would love to ask you what confuses you about the bass guitar? What's your biggest question? Please let me know in the comments below. So myth number one, and I've got to start here, is that bass is easy. Now, this is a very interesting discussion and in some respects there is some truth in it. But I want to tell you a story. I met a bass player when I was about 14 years old. He was an older guy that played in blues bands, a guy called Dave, and he said to me something which has stuck with me forever. Bass is as simple or as complicated as you like, and that's always stuck with me. So the fact is, you can get going super quickly and play the bass guitar, because to play simple, functional bass lines, you may just need to do something like this. One, two, three, bum, bum, Simple, very straightforward, and absolutely foundational. So that is why it could be really quick and easy to get going with the bass guitar. But the reality is you can take the bass guitar as far as you want to. It's as complicated or it's involved as any other instrument which is out there. You could spend hours upon hours a day honing your craft. So you can go from really simple bass lines like this, Play great bass or you could be going it's all down to what you want to do with the bass and how much time you want to put into it so myth number two is the bass is for failed guitarists and I'm gonna let you into a secret right now that I used to think that until I was about 16 years of age. I only started playing the bass because there were too many guitarists out there. And I was the guy which was the youngest and they said, well, you can play the bass. And I've read so many stories like that. Sometimes bass players think that they only ended up playing bass because they weren't good enough to be guitarists. But I had a moment when I was 17 years old which changed absolutely everything. I call this my drummer moment. And this was the first time I ever played with a great drummer. And I felt what it was like to play and feel the groove and feel that intense connection with the bottom end of the music and to feel really foundational in a band. And that was the moment when I fell in love with the bass and I realized what the true purpose of the bass was and how in my my opinion it's the most important instrument in the band because what we do is we connect the melody and the harmony and the rhythm together so that we really cannot have a band that doesn't have a bass player and it sounds very very empty so the bass is not for failed guitarists because quite simply in my view I believe we're the most important foundational member of the band. I also believe that we develop a different mindset as a bass player because I went from being the guy wanting to take all the crazy guitar solos and be up front and I went to being that guy which look, makes other people look good in the band by creating a great foundation. So playing the bass is definitely not for failed guitarists. So myth number three is proper bass players don't use a pick. So first off, are you trying to tell me that this doesn't sound cool? For me, that is a super cool sound. But the thing is, this idea that proper bass players don't use picks, I believe it comes from the 1960s and early 70s because what happened in those days is a lot of bass players in the early days started off as guitarists, so it was natural to carry that technique across. But the other thing that I discovered relatively recently 
from the fantastic studio bass player in the, here in the UK, Steve Pierce, is that up until the mid to late 70s, amplifier technology just wasn't up to it. So if you wanted to get a really, really punchy sound, the best way to do it was to use a pick and that would ensure that it really cut through the band. But this kind of misnomer has come through recently that the proper, the real guys, the heavy duty guys always use finger style. And the reality is I used to subscribe to that way of thinking. But then a couple of guys really changed my thinking when I was in my early 20s. The first one was when I heard the amazing Anthony Jackson on bass playing with Shaka Khan. My jaw hit the floor when I heard he was using a pick to create that sound. And the other one was when I discovered the great jazz bass guitar player Steve Swallow who plays with a pick too. It's a really, really fantastic sound that he creates. So at that point, the completely kind of reorientated how I thought about the pick and now I just think about the pick as being a tonal palette because they're tones that you just can't get with finger style when you use a pick. Let me demonstrate. <laughs> So it's absolutely impossible to get that tone with your fingers. So I always carry a pick around for that reason. So I use my fingers if I want to get one sound, I use the pick if I want to get another. But the reality is you may be wondering, well, what technique should I start off with? I always recommend starting off with finger style. The reason for that is the sound of a pick will normally stand out at the bottom of a band because it has a much, much more punchy sound. The sound of the fingers blends, so it's generally a much, much more versatile technique that could be used in more scenarios, but the pick unquestionably has its place. But there's also another scenario where you might want to use the pick too, and that's what I call a back-up technique. A very, very occasionally, and I'm talking like once every three, four, five years, I might do a very, very sweaty gig where the atmospherics of the room or the venue cause my fingers to blister. And that happened about, I don't know, three or four years back. And I had a pick in my gig bag so I could just take over and continue on and have a backup technique. And without that situation, I literally wouldn't have been able to get through the gig. So in my view, the pick is just as valid and expressive and as important as playing finger style. Now, myth number four is bass players shouldn't take solos. Now, I think in my view, that is complete nonsense. I think a well-placed bass solo can be one of the most exciting things on the planet. But I understand why many players get freaked out. I think it's often because they associate solos with high-end crazy jazz, this sort of thing. But the reality is, I think some of the best bass solos are ones which are heavily connected to the groove. And quite frankly, they are some of my favorite to play. And going back to the very first point of this this video, bass can be as simple or as complicated as you like. So this is an example of a sort of bass solo which I might play on a gig, maybe over a function. It might have this kind of groove. But what I'd start doing is just putting little fills in. But always come back to that groove. And then just gradually ramp up the intensity. Play lots of repeated patterns over and over again and just build up that tension slowly. And for me, that can be some of the best bass solos which are out there. But also, in my experience, audiences love bass, player, bass solos too, but they just got to be placed at the perfect point. So if you're on a gig, I would suggest maybe having one bass solo in an evening like that if it's appropriate. We've always got to remember we are a supporting role, but music is all about light and shade. So if we have that one perfectly bass bass solo, we create light and shade because it's a sound which the audience will not have heard yet on that gig. So I always think 
bass solos can be really, really good when placed correctly. Myth number five is you need big hands to play the bass. Now, first off, I want you to take a look at my hands here. By any stretch of the imagination, they are not huge. And I've earned a living playing the bass now for the best part of 20 years. But also, you've got to look at some of these crazy kids that are on Instagram, seven, eight, nine-year-old children, absolutely tearing it up. And that proves that you do not need big hands to play the bass guitar. There are just some subtle technique tweaks that you need to make to make the one finger per fret technique work for you. And this is one that players often miss. So let's, for instance, take, um, let's take a C major scale, for instance, here, and play the scale. And often players think they need to stretch their hands out to catch, catch all of the notes. And if your hands are big enough, I would advise doing that. But as my hands aren't huge, I do this little thing called micro shifts. So what I do is, so when we get to say the second finger there like that, I'm stretching to get the fourth. What I do is I gently release the first finger there and it slides subtly up like that. But the critical thing here is it's still touching the string. And what I can do is I can just pivot back and forward like that to get back to the E there. So there are these tiny little shifts happening within the one finger per fret just to loosen up and release some of the tension which is in the hand. This can also help you avoid injury too. This is really important. Now, the other one that I recommend is using the four over three techniques too. So if we take the one finger per fret technique like that, what we do instead is we use one, two, and the third and the fourth finger move together. Now, this is more like double bass technique, but this is great for playing grooves which are uh, using the box shape, or that kind of thing, or major pentatonic forward position. So there are lots and lots of subtle ways that you can adjust your technique if you've got smaller hands. But I want you to know it's perfectly possible. But the other one you could always consider is a short scale length neck. This is a 34 inch neck. So the length is 34 inches from nut to bridge but you can take them down as low as 30 inches as well. And that might be more comfortable. There's some players in the eBay guitar community which absolutely swear by short scale necks. But the reality is you do not need massive hands to play the bass guitar. So guys, that's the end of today's bass video. If you've enjoyed this content, make sure you grab access to our completely free bass players action pack, which will introduce you to all of the most important skills that beginner to intermediate bass guitar players need to get rocking and get jamming. There is a link in the description below where you can grab your free access today. Cheers, I've been James from ebassguitar.com and I'll catch you next time.